If you've followed me for very long, you're well aware that I'm a huge fan of Sam Harris's Waking Up app. In addition to being the best guide to learning meditation, it also has 30 or more lessons that cover a wide range of topics that are essentially guiding principles for living a good life. And since we've all heard that golf is a microcosm of life, it stands to reason that good life advice should also be good golf advice. When I work directly with a player, I have them purchase the Waking Up app. I tell them to listen to seven or eight of the lessons that I've selected, and I have them listen to them once to get a general idea of the message, and then I tell them to listen to it immediately again while thinking of it as it relates to golf. Sam's team was gracious enough to allow me to include one of my favorite lessons in this video. Its title is Solving Problems. Let's listen to it once to get the message, and then I'm going to play it again and pause it at certain spots to highlight how I see it relating to golf. I would give almost anything to have had the knowledge from just this one message when I was in my 20s playing professional golf. What Sam makes so simple here is what I could not figure out on my own. This is the basis of what I teach and the backbone of what I know to be true in life. I woke up the other day in a truly lousy mood and was immediately hit with several small problems in my inbox which, magnified by my mood, struck me as minor emergencies. And later that day at lunch with a friend, I began to complain about these problems. And my friend said two things that were extraordinarily wise. And here you'll see the psychological value of being in good company, but also the value of being someone who's committed to seeing his mind and life in a certain way. So after hearing me out, the first thing she said was, well, none of these problems seem that big, right? You can easily deal with these things. So the question is, do you really want to be this stressed out right now? Now, of course, that was a rhetorical question. She knew the answer was no, and she was simply reminding me that it was possible for me to be mindful of how my thoughts and emotions were arising in that moment, like a perpetual motion machine of dissatisfaction. She was reminding me that I could give them space and that it was possible to achieve real equanimity in the present, whatever these problems were. But of course, if you don't know how to meditate, you can't really do that. You have to find some way to think yourself into a new state of mind. You have to begin solving the problems. Otherwise, you can't get off the ride. But if you can be mindful, you can change your state before you solve your problem or apparent problem, before you think your way through to a place of optimism about the future. So the fact that I wasn't paying close attention to the mechanics of my own mind was my real problem in that moment. I was the problem. What I was doing with my attention was the real proximate cause of my unhappiness and my unhappiness was what was motivating me in that moment to brood about my problems. But then she addressed my situation on a conceptual level as well, which is often even more useful, because simply reminding someone to be mindful doesn't prevent him from falling back into the same pattern of thinking a minute or an hour later. Finding a new framework in which to think about a problem can. So she said, were you really expecting to have no more problems at some point in your life? You were just going to wake up one morning and none of this would be happening? There'd be nothing on your to-do list? Do you actually want nothing on your to-do list? Life is mostly about solving problems, and you can solve these. So my problem, more than anything else, was that I was treating problems themselves as anomalies. I was tacitly assuming that I should be able to get rid of all my problems and avoid any new ones. Even though this sounds ridiculous, that was implicit to my thinking and to my emotional life, to the way I was meeting each new problem. But of course, I can never get to a place where problems stop appearing, and neither can you. Life is an unending series of complications. So it doesn't make any sense to be surprised by the arrival of the next one. The magnitude of the problem might surprise you, but the fact that new complications in your life are arising, hour by hour, is absolutely to be expected. 
right? Very soon, some machine that you're relying on to do your work or to keep you comfortable is going to break. This is guaranteed to happen. You're also going to catch a cold in the not-too-distant future. And your plane will be late, or your luggage will get lost. At some point, you will injure your knee and need to see a doctor for it. It can't be any other way. Really, it can't be any other way. And the expectation that it can or should be some other way is a great source of unnecessary suffering. Suffering that actually makes it harder to solve the problems we happen to be faced with. Ironically, this is a problem that you can solve. And you can do that by expecting more problems to arise every day of your life. It's like you're playing a video game. Did you expect that there would be some incredibly boring level of this video game without problems? This is the game we call existence. Problems continually arise. So enjoy them. This is such a simple message, and it's one we've heard a million different ways. But Sam is so eloquent that everything he says simply carries a lot of weight with it. It's much more memorable and persuasive as a result, and he frames everything so well that he leaves you feeling like you'd have to be an idiot to not put the work in to make these ideas second nature for you. Let's listen to this message again, and I'm going to pause it a few times to show you how I think it relates to golf. I think this is going to be a fun exercise, and it's an example of how I think you should work your way through the rest of the lessons in the Waking Up app. At the end of this video, I'll show you how to get the app for 20% off for a year. And for the record, I'm not being compensated in any fashion if you do happen to buy Sam's app. I believe in it so much that I took the time to work with Sam's team to generate a discount code for decaders so you can continue your learning process with him. I woke up the other day in a truly lousy mood and was immediately hit with several small problems in my inbox which, magnified by my mood, struck me as minor emergencies. Every day we're going to face small challenges on the golf course. You will miss fairways, you will miss greens, you will have three putts. These missteps are guaranteed to happen in most, if not all, rounds. And while the first mistake might not impact you, the second and third certainly could if they're in close succession. If you treat these small challenges as disasters, it's easy to let your emotions take over and that's how you start making mental errors like trying to force shots from a lack of discipline and patience because you're trying to get a few shots back instead of sticking to your game plan and just playing smart golf. And later that day at lunch with a friend, I began to complain about these problems. And my friend said two things that were extraordinarily wise. And here you'll see the psychological value of being in good company, but also the value of being someone who's committed to seeing his mind and life in a certain way. So after hearing me out, the first thing she said was, well, none of these problems seem that big, right? You can easily deal with these things. So the question is, do you really want to be this stressed out right now? Now, of course, that was a rhetorical question. She knew the answer was no, and she was simply reminding me that it was possible for me to be mindful of how my thoughts and emotions were arising in that moment, like a perpetual motion machine of dissatisfaction. She was reminding me that I could give them space and that it was possible to achieve real equanimity in the present, whatever these problems were. The role that Sam's friend is actually playing here is that of a great caddy, if you really think about it. One of the best lessons that I learned while caddying for Will Zalatoris when he won the Texas Am in the U.S. Junior in 2014 was the idea of being your own caddy. Some of the stuff that we say to ourselves in our own internal dialogue, I mean, we just would never say to somebody else if we were caddying for them. Sam has a great line in another lesson where he says, at what point will you learn to have better conversations with yourself? One of the best things I've learned since beginning my personal meditation practice is, yes, to hopefully have a better conversation with myself, but at a minimum, to recognize when I'm having a bad conversation with myself, or to simply recognize when my thought process is starting to speed up due to some outside influences. 
A great example of this also comes from Caddying for Will in 2014. If any of you have the Decade card, you'll see the word time on it, and that's referring to the song Time from the movie Inception. What that meant was if I could see Will starting to speed up or stress out in any way, but say he was on the other side of the green, I could just point to my watch, which signified time, as a cue for him to try to monitor and slow his thinking and to trust me to figure out what to do on the next shot. All I needed him to do was to be actively slowing his thinking down before it got out of control. I needed Will to put a little space between himself and his thought process, like Sam says. One of my favorite sayings that kind of tidies this all up is, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. But of course, if you don't know how to meditate, you can't really do that. You have to find some way to think yourself into a new state of mind. You have to begin solving the problems. Otherwise, you can't get off the ride. But if you can be mindful, you can change your state before you solve your problem or apparent problem before you think your way through to a place of optimism about the future. Players ask me all the time what they should be thinking about in some situation during a golf tournament. What they're really doing here is manufacturing a problem because they don't realize they're actually starting to panic or get uncomfortable for some reason. I know what they mean by this question is the same question bounced around in my head in my 20s. This is also how I know it's the beginning stage of panic. My answer in the past has always been, if you're wondering what you should be thinking about in any given moment, unless you're actively deciding on a golf shot, your default should be nothing. Thinking more deeply about this question, my answer now is that if you're wondering what you should be thinking about, you should begin meditating. Starting a meditation is, as Sam says, how you get off the ride. And as many of you know, when you're playing a golf tournament, you're on a thrill ride. This is not It's a Small World. Your thoughts are beginning to speed up, and you're probably on a path to starting to make emotional decisions, which typically are not going to be good decisions. So the fact that I wasn't paying close attention to the mechanics of my own mind was my real problem in that moment. I was the problem. What I was doing with my attention was the real proximate cause of my unhappiness. And my unhappiness was what was motivating me in that moment to brood about my problems. But then she addressed my situation on a conceptual level as well, which is often even more useful. Because simply reminding someone to be mindful doesn't prevent him from falling back into the same pattern of thinking a minute or an hour later. Finding a new framework in which to think about a problem can. I was the problem. I mean, wow, just digest that for a moment. If somebody had told me in my 20s that I was the problem, so much of my life would have been better. Rather than blame something or someone else or feel helpless, I could have worked on the problem and the work I would prescribe to myself would be a meditation practice. And the reason I would prescribe a meditation practice is learning to handle and be prepared for adversity away from the golf course will help you be prepared for the adversity we all now know we will face on a daily basis. We need to program our default settings when emotions are low in order to perform our best under the gun. So she said, were you really expecting to have no more problems at some point in your life? You were just going to wake up one morning and none of this would be happening? There'd be nothing on your to-do list? Do you actually want nothing on your to-do list? Life is mostly about solving problems, and you can solve these as we make progress here, I think you can really start to see how silly ever getting mad on the golf course is. Golf is almost entirely problems and adversity. I mean, on the first tee, did you really expect to not have any problems? To not hit any bad shots? If you know something is guaranteed to happen, how can you be surprised when it happens? Even more blunt is how stupid do you have to be to get mad when it happens and then mess up even more shots after the fact? Sam's friend says, do you actually want nothing on your to-do list? Now, obviously, it would be ideal to not have any problems on the golf course, but that's not going to happen. So you have to be prepared for them and handle them correctly. So my problem, more than anything else, was that I was treating problems themselves as anomalies. I was tacitly assuming that I should be able to get rid of all my problems and avoid any new ones. 
even though this sounds ridiculous, that was implicit to my thinking and to my emotional life, to the way I was meeting each new problem. But of course, I can never get to a place where problems stop appearing, and neither can you. Life is an unending series of complications, so it doesn't make any sense to be surprised by the arrival of the next one. The magnitude of the problem might surprise you, but the fact that new complications in your life are arising, hour by hour, is absolutely to be expected. So, we must expect and accept that problems will arise on the golf course. Understanding this fact is how you avoid the downward spiral, and the downward spiral is where all of your high scores are born. After all, there are two ways to lower your scores. Have the lower end of your scoring range be lower, or have the higher end of your scoring range be, well, less high. This gets back to my old saying that it is easier to intentionally not lose strokes than it is to intentionally gain strokes. Meaning, it's easier to not make silly bogeys than it is to make more birdies. All of the data supports this idea. I mean, very soon, some machine that you're relying on to do your work or to keep you comfortable is going to break. This is guaranteed to happen. You're also going to catch a cold in the not too distant future. And your plane will be late or your luggage will get lost. At some point, you will injure your knee and need to see a doctor for it. It can't be any other way. Really, it can't be any other way. And the expectation that it can or should be some other way is a great source of unnecessary suffering. Suffering that actually makes it harder to solve the problems we happen to be faced with. Ironically, this is a problem that you can solve. And you can do that by expecting more problems to arise every day of your life. It's like you're playing a video game. Did you expect that there would be some incredibly boring level of this video game without problems? This is the game we call existence. Problems continually arise. So enjoy them. A pretty common podcast question is, what advice would you give your 25-year-old self? The content of this video is the advice I would give my 25-year-old self. It's the backbone of living a good life. I mean, playing great golf. I mean, I do hope to help you shoot lower scores, but I truly hope to help you sidestep many of the mistakes I've made, most of which could have been avoided simply by giving a little space between the stimulus and whatever my response was. I hope you all have a great 2020 and a great decade for that matter. I hope in 2030 you can look back and be proud of the decade you just lived. You know, actually, Tony Robbins has a great quote that will end with along these lines. He says, Surely the next 10 years is going to pass. The only question is where are you going to arrive? If you take the time to subscribe to the Waking Up app and commit to 10 minutes a day, that's all it is, 10 minutes a day of a meditative process, I promise you you're going to arrive in a much better place than if you don't. Now, let me show you how to get the app for 20% off, like I said earlier. And remember, I'm not getting compensated in any way for providing this code to you. Start by visiting the site wakingup.com. Click on subscribe in the upper right-hand corner. You'll enter and then verify your email address. And once you're logged in, you choose settings, redeem promo code, and then you enter the code DECADE. They send it to me in all caps. I have no idea if it needs to be in all caps or not, but may as well put it in all caps. Enter decade and you'll get the full year for 20% off, which is only $79. If you made it this far in the video, congratulations. And you also just sat there and listened to the promo code for waking up, which makes me think you're actually going to do it. Since you made it this far, 20 minutes in, I'm going to pay you for your time. The decade app is normally $290 for a year, or it's $199 for six months and then it goes to $20 a month. Since you made it this far, if you send me an email, I'll give you a promo code to get a full year for half off. I'll give you the Decade app for $150 for a full year. Thanks for at a minimum considering what I have to say. I really can't believe the podium I have to help people that I'll likely never meet play better golf and live happier lives. 
Cheers to a great 2020.